I should like to talk to you briefly about civil rights and human freedom. It is my deep conviction that we have reached a turning point in the long history of our country's efforts to guarantee freedom and equality to all our citizens. Our immediate task is to remove the last remnants of the barrier which stand between millions of our citizens and their birthright. There is no justifiable reason for discrimination because of ancestry or religion or race or color. In our prior segments, we have touched on some things that need to be discussed further before we can truly know the impact cryptocurrency will have over time. Some of these things were not obvious in 2009, the year the Bitcoin blockchain was implemented. In the early days, Bitcoin was basically worthless and seemed to be a mere curiosity to most people hearing of it. You could hardly give them away in the beginning. The few of us that decided to mine them didn't even really know what to do with this new invention at first. The system was fairly cumbersome to use and had quite a few flaws. In the early days, you could not divide them down. You had to use whole bitcoins in any transaction. Eventually, mining pools formed, which made it a little easier to obtain them. Many of the early miners were basically just hobbyists. I used my laptop to mine them back when that was still possible. Now, you need insanely powerful and expensive equipment to even get fractions of a bitcoin. By design, for the first four years, there was a 50 Bitcoin Easter egg of sorts awarded every 10 minutes to the computer that randomly guessed the right answer to a relatively straightforward math problem at the time. The problem automatically gets proportionally harder as more processing power competes for it. Our computers were working day and night throwing guesses at the Bitcoin protocol. Grabbing up a block of coins created a certain sense of satisfaction despite it not really being that useful for anything substantive. There were no exchanges of note in the beginning. You could buy Bitcoin assuming you were willing to take the risk by, say, sending money to people on message boards and so forth. Satoshi was actively building and correcting problems in the code then. The emergence of this technology was so revolutionary because it resolved an old transactional problem that nobody could ever find a practical solution for. Satoshi's great achievement was that he was able to solve what is called the double spend problem and he did it with a novel consensus mechanism that we now call the blockchain. This advance is what makes a decentralized currency possible. Honestly, if someone had come up with this solution back in the 1980s, we could have had Bitcoin back then too. It really isn't that hard to grasp, it's just that nobody ever found a clever solution for it until Satoshi did. I don't think many of the early Bitcoin miners really cared that much about the system or even realized what they were toying with. It seemed like most miners ultimately found some enjoyment when they were able to gamble them away on Satoshi Dice, a popular online betting game that had emerged. Satoshi Dice seemed for a time to be about the only entertaining thing you could do with Bitcoins. They were like virtual Chuck E. Cheese tokens. Then somebody bought a couple pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins, which seemed like more of a publicity stunt at the time. Actually, since all Bitcoin transactions are public, you can still go look up that transaction on the blockchain and see it for yourself. That was widely publicized, but of course, it didn't really change many minds regarding this weird new cryptocurrency. If you don't already know this, there was a Genesis block which awarded the very first 50 Bitcoins, dated January 3rd, 2009. If you look at the underlying data embedded in the open source blockchain files from that day, there is a fascinating statement hidden in the code. It said, The Times, 3rd of January, 2009, Chancellor on Brink of Second Bailout for Banks. It referenced a front page article written in London. It was the Times newspaper issued the same day coinciding with the launch of Bitcoin and the first block reward. This was no incidental or subtle coincidence. It was a manifesto. A technologic and financial war was declared that day. The first shot across the bow of what is genuinely an archaic currency infrastructure. The old world order had no idea the magnitude of this gesture from an unknown revolutionary set in motion simply with one last press of a button. While supply line barons, warlords, and even governments were continually fleecing the world through abuse of the poor and underprivileged, banks were the ones getting the bailout again. 
Satoshi, a talented and young but largely amateur programmer, had had enough. He was not willing to continue enduring the endless graft and exploitation of value transfer. Governments of the world were doing what they always have done, printing money to solve problems created by the irresponsible spending policy of inept politicians. That day, he fastened a nuclear time bomb to sovereign currencies and simultaneously poisoned them with an insidious mathematic algorithm that would grow without any possible way to stop it. He did it anonymously. Why? I will explain that in more detail in further segments, but for now, let it be enough for me to say that he did it for us, the people, as an unselfish gesture of goodwill and kindness. You may not believe that, but it's true. And knowing his character, I can personally attest to it. When I say he did it for us, I mean humanity. Now, to be frank, he really wasn't focused on the privileged Western or industrialized world so much. He was thinking of much more troubling problems than people being unable to, say, make house payments or paying their cable bill. His mind was troubled over a much larger problem that was completely rancid and unchecked. He had the slaves on his mind that day. Slavery is where the story of cryptocurrency has to start because that is where it was needed the most. You are going to need to see the next segment as we tackle the issue of slavery in a way you have probably never considered before. I think you may be surprised as to where all of this is going.